NerdErotic.com. While I'm very happy to be back from my break, surrounded by my plastic pals and bringing you news, I'm very sorry to say it's not very good. It's about Star Trek Picard, and it's about dystopian Trek. And it comes from two articles, one from the CBS-owned CNET and the other from the mainstream media, New York Times. But before I get started, if you like what I do here, please consider subscribing to the channel and liking and sharing the videos. That is the only way an independent creator like yours truly can stay competitive against the giant corporations like CBS that YouTube has decided to prioritize on this platform. And if you do it with your favorite YouTuber as well, I'm sure they would appreciate appreciate it too. Let's start out with the mainstream media and the New York Times. They asked the question, can Star Trek chart a way forward? With Picard, a spinoff following Patrick Stewart's Starfleet officer, the franchise is trying to rediscover its place in a universe it effectively invented. And in a way, it did invent fandom here in America, although Doctor Who did precede it over in the UK. And the reason they have to rediscover Star Trek is because of Star Trek Discovery by Dave Itchkoff. Santa Clarita, California. Michael Chabon's job used to consist of writing novels, and it used to consist of running this show, earning literary acclaim and receiving the occasional prestigious award. But this past June, he was racing around the sound stages here at Star Trek Picard, where he was working as an executive producer. The key word there was was. Shaban, a 56-year-old Pulitzer Prize winner, strode through hallways decorated with timelines they promptly ignored. Oh, I'm sorry. That chronicled the fictional histories of alien empires and stepped onto the set of a futuristic spacecraft. He giggled to himself as he toyed with some of the fake technology, occasionally exclaiming, Engage! and flashed a thumbs up across the room to the Picard star, Patrick Stewart, as he rehearsed a scene. Now, there have been a lot of rumors as to why Michael Chabon either left the show or was fired, but maybe we heard the reason right there. Maybe he was constantly walking up to Patrick Stewart going, Engage! These were all welcome perks in Chabon's new line of work, but maybe they weren't welcome perks to Patrick Stewart. But what drew him to Star Trek as a fan in his teens and kept him invested as a producer, he said, was an underlying message about humanity that was hopeful within reason. And here we get to the crux of the problem with Kurtzman Trek. Star Trek has an underlying message about humanity that is hopeful. You end your sentence right there. You don't add within reason. This is simplifying it and it is spin, but he continues. It's not saying human beings are basically wonderful and if we just learn to agree, all of our problems will go away, he explained. It takes work. It takes effort. That's not what Starfleet is about. People still disagree. The problem a lot of Star Trek fans have with this show, including ones that like Discovery, is its dystopian point of view, which is literally the opposite of what Gene Roddenberry wanted to portray on screen. So too does keeping alive a venerable science fiction franchise like Star Star Trek, which has been in the public consciousness for nearly 54 years. What began in 1966 with a little seen television series that was often didactic, hold, hard stop right there. Didactic, adjective, intended to teach, particularly in having moral instruction as an ulterior motive or in the manner of a teacher, particularly so as to treat someone in a patronizing way. Aside from the usage of the word didactic being completely pretentious, it gives us a little insight as to where the author of this article is coming from. And as far as the original series low ratings are concerned, this is called into question by author Mark Cushman, who's written a multi-volume series called these are the voyages. And we license the Nielsen ratings for every single episode, disproving the 50-year myth uh, that uh, the show didn't perform well on the network. Uh, it was actually NBC's top-rated Thursday night show when it was on Thursdays. They moved it to Friday for the second season. It was their top-rated Friday night show. And anybody who doubts this can get the books and they can see the ratings report for every single 
episode. We'll backtrack a little bit. What began in 1966 with a little scene television series that was often didactic and deliberately paced again. To retort in an equally douchey manner, it seems that the author of this article's Star Trek knowledge is cursory, and if it was didactic as in patronizing and deliberately paced as in slow and measured, how did millions of kids, including yours truly, get into this show at a very early age? has endured as a cultural institution, even as its fortunes have risen and fallen over the years, and most recently fallen, its humble beginnings gave rise to a vibrant and dedicated fan base, multiple TV spin-offs, and a film franchise that has expanded and contracted many times over. Again, we see CBS's backing of this article, in my opinion. In the Vanity Fair article, we saw the minimization of the original series, and now we are seeing it here. But what did they add in this article? What can we expect new from Picard? Well, we're going to go to two articles for this. We'll start out with the New York Times. Stewart said he appreciated how the story allowed for the profound psychological differences in the character who felt abandoned, distrusted, and unnecessary rather than presenting a valiant Picard who was in command of every situation he faced. Picard wasn't in command of every situation he faced. Did you watch the series? But he was confident, but we know that confidence in a male these days is considered toxic masculinity. What I'm guessing we're going to get is the broken down hero following around the girl who is the key to everything, just like we saw in Logan. And the bad guys will be Starfleet and Section 31, just like every other Star Trek Kurtzman joint. I don't think they're going to be breaking any ground with this because it's Kurtzman. We have priors with this dude. He has broken no ground in the past and neither has Shaban in television and neither has Akiva Goldsman. Where is he now, he asked. What matters to him? What control does he have over his life? Very little, it turns out. Wow, I'm really looking forward to a mopey old man running around in space. This brings us to a couple of snippets from a CNET article, which is owned by CBS, that gives us a little more insight as to what we can expect from Picard. Star Trek Picard is a mirror to our modern dystopia. Our modern dystopia. From the rise of artificial intelligence, because we haven't seen that one done to death, to the questioning of authority. What is this, the 60s? Picard tackles the biggest questions we're asking today. Why are there so many goddamn reboots? Jean-Luc Picard is in a dramatically different place in Star Trek Picard. When we last left him on Star Trek The Next Generation, or in the final TNG film, Star Trek Nemesis, there was still hope and belief in the Federation. Ah, oh, here it comes. Two decades later, Picard played with full-throated vim and vigor by Patrick Stewart instead rants about its failings and why he resigned. Oh my god. Again, I will hope for the best, but expect the worst. Why? Because I've watched Star Trek Discovery, each episode multiple times. I know what to expect from Alex Kurtzman and Akiva Goldsman. We are talking about the people who brought us sonar in space. The galaxy was mourning, burying its dead, and Starfleet slunk from its duties. Picard barks a nod to the distraction of Romulus that sets off the chain of events from the Jar Jar Abrams-directed Star Trek film. He calls the Federation downright criminal. Of course, this also was preceded by a countdown comic book, which they ignored the canon from because it features a Captain Data. I was not prepared to stand by and be a spectator, he said. Surprising words from the former prototypical captain of the Federation, but it speaks both to the state of where Picard is and the fact that the future isn't as rosy as it once was. I see what you did there, talking about Star Trek's future in the past tense, alluding to the franchise needing to remain relevant. Well, in Alex Kurtzman's outdated attempt to remain relevant, he's just put an expiration date on this franchise. The scene is also the clearest statement to fans that Star Trek Picard is going to be shite. I'm sorry, which premieres January 23rd isn't just a rehash of TNG. No, it's just a repurposing of TNG, which ended its run nearly 26 years ago, and that's where it will stay for me. Star Trek Discovery, the first Trek show to run on CBS All Ass, I'm sorry, All Access, 
Disclosure, CNET and CBS All Access are both owned by Viacom CBS. Picard embraces the conflict of the shades of gray embraced by contemporary television, but that some fans may see as a departure from Gene Roddenberry's hopeful vision of the future. Some fans, all fans, it's whether they're willing to accept it or not. It's a departure. But some fans forget Star Trek has always reflected society. No, we haven't forgotten that, Roger. Picard likewise serves as a mirror exploring real-life issues including artificial intelligence through the Borg. Yeah, because artificial intelligence gone wrong has never been done in science fiction before. And the rights of synthetics, like data as a new species. Again, done recently, done to death, and done much better. This is nothing new. Further tickling the synopsis is Akiva Goldsman. Star Trek Picard co-creator and executive producer who raises the idea that synthetics represent a population that's been marginalized, a reflection of our own society's tendency to exclude or diminish those who are different. Just because something's been done to death doesn't mean it won't be good, unless it's by Alex Kurtzman and Akiva Goldsman. Now back to the New York Times article, and we get to the bottom of what is going to be the fundamental problem with this new Star Trek franchise, which was unique on its own. It had its own unique look. It had its own characters. It has decades of history that they are just going to throw away because they want to copy other things. They want to make Star Trek Marvel. They want to make Star Trek Star Wars. Star Trek is also trying to rediscover its place in a universe it effectively invented. It helped bring genre entertainment into the mainstream and gave its fans a voice in the conversation about what it should be and where it should go. A voice that the new regime has promptly ignored, but it has been eclipsed by its successors from longtime rivals like Star Wars to more recent competitors like Marvel movies, and it's striving to stay relevant. Striving to be relevant in the most unoriginal way by making all of their Star Trek shows just copies of other shows. But at the time when entertainment franchises have become the lifeblood of media conglomerates, Star Trek by no means the hippest or flashiest of these pop culture juggernauts. Again, hard stop there. You're absolutely right. It's not. But that's what they're trying to make it. And then it stops being Star Trek. Journeys on. And the people in charge of this property, the repurposers, believe it still has plenty of longevity. And that longevity is coming to an end. The series is aging out. And a reminder, we are three years into this Kurtzman Trek project and they seem to be stuck in the building phase as well as pliability and potential for further growth if they stay true to its idiosyncratic values. Alex Kurtzman is capable of uttering some pretty cringeworthy quotes. I want to remind you this is the man who said, and for me personally, I've had a harder time writing men. That's the truth. I don't know why. It's always been the case. Now, Alex Kurtzman will say whatever needs to be said. He's not honest, and I think, in my opinion, he's an intellectual property thief. If you feel that each piece is handcrafted with care, then I think people really appreciate it, said Alex Kurtzman, an executive producer of the many new Star Trek series. If you feel like a universe is being shoved down your throat for speed and for dollars, then there's no faster way to lose an audience. Alex Kurtzman is a poser, and I'm starting to think he's an empty shell because that's the exact criticism people have of his Star Trek. So he either heard it at a cocktail party or read it in somebody's comments on a YouTube video and decided to repeat it here to play some 4D chess. No, we're on to you, dude. And then the New York Times gives us his repurposing IMDB. Alias Run Lola Run, Fringe, X-Files, Sleepy Hollow, Hawaii Five-0, which is a repurposed 70s series for the kids out there. Of course, we know about his first run at Star Trek, and now he's taking on Silence of the Lambs. This guy is a hack. He had two previous franchises, as you all know, and he completely obliterated both of them, and one of them was Spider-Man. So why did they go to Alex Kurtzman? They state in this article that the reboot from Jar Jar Abrams had ran aground. It had gone dormant, yet they use the same exact aesthetic in the new series. Why would you use that? Laziness. That's the answer to that question.
We needed each other, Kurtzman said. Star Trek was at a place where it needed to be reinvented is a wrong word, but rebirthed in a way. Repurposed is the word you're looking for, Alex Kurtzman, and you were willing to do anything to get this franchise that didn't need you. I did not want Star Trek to go down on my watch, he added. That was something I knew I could never live down. Well, you're never going to live that down. So we know Alex Kurtzman broke up with his creative partner, Roberto Orsi. Then the article goes into the problems the show has had. It got rid of Brian Fuller, the original showrunner of Star Trek Discovery, who might have given us a decent show. The series faced personal problems, ballooning costs, and production delays, and Fuller left the show before its launch in 2017. His successors, Gretchen J. Berg and Aaron Harberts, who were his people, so much for loyalty in Hollywood, were pushed out before the debut of season two amid more runaway budgets and allegations of an abusive management style. What they don't mention in the article is the Walter Mosley situation, which I think sheds new light on Gretchen and Aaron's situation. Please see my video right here. Walter Mosley was telling a story with some other writers privately in a room where he used the N-word. By the way, he is half black and half Jewish. And of course, somebody snitched him out and he ended up quitting before having to be humiliated by HR at CBS. And we also know that Anson Mount had a problem with a director and they made that public as well. You are not supposed to make HR incidents public, but they have no problem doing it. What is the constant with all of these problems? Alex Kurtzman. Kind of reminds you of somebody else who runs a certain franchise that they mention quite a bit in this article as well. And interesting news within this article, they say Michelle Paradise is the acting showrunner for the coming third season, which means Alex Kurtzman is not. Now, the argument can be made that he's overseeing all these shows and he wasn't meant to be the showrunner, and I am certainly willing to listen to that. Or you could say that CBS has to honor his contract and they want to keep him creatively off the shows. Guess we'll never know. There's also something else we'll never know. CBS All Access said that Discovery is its most watched original series. I didn't catch that wording before. Most watched original original series. I wonder what that means. Though it has not released the viewership data. Again, you could take them at face value and I would think you would release at least some vague data proving this, but they have yet to do so. I have heard different. I have heard it is not the most watched show on their network, but we get into the reason why they brought us Star Trek Picard. It was sufficiently heartened by the show's performance to increase its Star Trek output. You can certainly believe that at face value, and that might be the reason because I don't know for sure. Or you can consider they needed to bring in Star Trek Picard to keep this franchise going during the streaming wars because Star Trek Discovery was indeed a failure. Kurtzman said he and his colleagues believe that there is still a broad enough fan base for Star Trek, older and younger, hardcore and casual, that would respond to a range of different programs. In other words, we're going to just throw anything at the wall and see what sticks because we don't know what Star Trek is because they continue to make Star Trek for people who don't like Star Trek by people who don't know Star Trek. Goldsman said he felt that Star Wars was the only natural franchise competitor that Star Trek faces. Well, we know that's not true because there is no competition. Star Wars crushes Star Trek every single time, even after the fall of Skywalker. The only natural competitor to Star Trek right now is its parody, the Orville, which has become the new Star Trek, and now Star Trek is the parody. The New York Times article for a second time brings up the low original series ratings. Akiva Goldsman brings up the miniskirt debate again, which we know is disingenuous because you're judging people from another time on current year standards. And we know the miniskirt was there for sex appeal and as a middle finger to the prudes at the time. What has changed significantly since the introduction of Star Trek is the degree to which media companies have grown reliant on franchises and are reluctant to give up on old properties that might have any familiarity to audiences. Stating the obvious, Goldsman said, looking down at his lunch, he observed, we could take this plate and reboot it. I'm sure you would think that, but you have to actually have talent to do that. 
The Marvel movies, which have grossed billions of dollars worldwide, have provided a modern-day template for franchises' success. Start with fantasy or science fiction source material and create a shared universe in which its characters coexist and cross paths. Except the biggest problem is, that's only happened once. But that gives you an idea of how the mainstream media sees it, a lot of people in the access media see it, and the bankers who run Hollywood see it. Get product that is science fiction and fantasy, put it out there, and the nerds will come just automatically, showing their fundamental misunderstanding of fandom and how this thing works. And this is why Star Trek will not. Kurtzman stated there had not been any real conversations between the Star Trek movie and TV hemispheres for nearly a decade, adding, the ink's not quite dry on the merger, so it'll take a bit of time for the integration of the two companies to bear fruit. Time will tell. I think a shared universe could be great for Star Trek. Star Trek, an established IP, has been in the building phase for their franchise for three years now, and they're basing it on a show no one likes, Star Trek Discovery, a show with an 80-year-old lead, Star Trek Picard, a Phineas and Ferb Star Trek, and a Rick and Morty Star Trek. How much more time do you need, and how much more proof do you need that you shouldn't have a poser running your shared universe? And that's what Alex Kurtzman is. Star Trek Picard is proof of that. You're taking an original IP again and you're turning it into Logan Blade Runner The Expanse in the Fifth Element. Marketing research has shown CBS wants their show to be as popular as Game of Thrones, but proving they don't know the difference between that and Lord of the Rings, let's mix in a little Romulegalos. I guess we'll find out in a couple of days. My suspicions are this is going to be a train wreck, but if I'm wrong, I will be very happy to let you know that we have good Star Trek. I will be live after every episode each Thursday as alternate programming to Will Wheaton's Ready Room. You can come join me in the Pea Corner. Until then, everybody have a great day. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video. Nerderotic.com Please subscribe.